a 75 year old lady is being treated for UTI and you notice that her calcium level on her morning lab was 7 mg per deciliter. What's next? Calcium value on BMP, basic metabolic panel or complete metabolic panel CMP is actually the total serum calcium. And the total serum calcium equal or it's made of free calcium plus the bound calcium. The ionized or free calcium versus total calcium. The ionized free calcium is 40 to 45%. 40 to 45% of calcium bound to protein, mainly albumin. And there is 15% is bound to other anions. Now, any increase or decrease in total calcium does not equal or by default mean decrease or increase in ionized free calcium so total calcium cannot tell you about the value of ionized calcium unfortunately the increase or any decrease in albumin it will lead to increase or decrease in total calcium as we said 40 to 45 percent of calcium is bound to albumin ionized free calcium is the active form is really the form that works in the body and only ionized calcium is regulated by pth or vitamin t so it's not the total calcium it's the free calcium that regulated by vitamin d and as you know we always correct total calcium to albumin any increase or decrease by one gram of albumin roughly lead to increase or decrease by 0.8 milligram in total calcium few things here alkalosis increase albion bound cup calcium which leads to decrease free calcium example hyperventilation the opposite is true which means acidosis decrease the albion bound calcium increase the free calcium pth as you know decrease albion bound calcium increase free calcium and high phosphorus or hyperphosphatemia phosphorus as you know binds to calcium leading to decrease free calcium ionized calcium level is the best test to diagnose hypo or hypercalcemia the problem though it's expensive and not widely available now total calcium level obtained routinely as we know with cmp or bmp and we need to always correct for albumin and we always need to correct total calcium level for albumin level even if calcium level is normal we need to correct it to albumin any increase or decrease in total calcium we need to correct it for albumin first after that if there is any evidence of hyper or hypocalcemia the next step we need to confirm it with ionized or free calcium level if available at your facility very important to remember that ionized calcium reference values are a say dependent and may be different from one facility to another so check your lab references for a summary of this video please subscribe to my substack the link is provided below now hypocalcemia defined by total calcium less than 8 mg per deciliter after it's corrected for albumin and remember we need to confirm it with free calcium level if available and remember the free calcium level values to decide hypocalcemia are assay dependent some lab references i know they use 4.8 mg per deciliter but less than that but some other labs may use different references so check with your labs now back to our example here calcium was 7 mg per deciliter albumin was 3.9 so the corrected total calcium was 7 mg per deciliter because normal albumin is 4 is almost there so what's next next is to check ionized calcium level if available and for this patient was 2.7 now hypocalcemia can be either acute or chronic now acute there is acute drop in total calcium to less than 7.5 gram per deciliter again corrected to albumin or less than 3 milligram per deciliter in ionized calcium these kind of patients needs urgent treatment urgent inpatient treatment so we need to compare to a baseline calcium level and if there is no baseline calcium level to compare to and the patient has no symptom to suggest hypocalcemia we consider that chronic chronic patients usually asymptomatic or if they have symptoms usually mild non-urgent outpatient treatment again always compared to previous labs now hypocalcemia can be asymptomatic or mild symptoms or symptomatic if you see any of these symptoms that means we need urgent treatment spasm remember the word spasm bronchospasm laryngospasm or carpopedal spasm seizures prolonged QTC, irritability, anxiety, or depression, although these can be non-specific and hard to tell if they are related to hypocalcemia. I borrowed these pictures from up to date. I'm not sure if anyone does this test anymore. So if you see these signs, then the patient needs urgent inpatient treatment. So now, as you just saw, the treatment urgency is decided by the severity of symptoms and or the acuity of hypocalcemia, not by the absolute calcium level. Now back to our patient, 
We found labs done for the same patient a week ago and calcium was 9 mg per deciliter and albumin back then was 4. So they corrected one 9, right? Because albumin is normal. So total calcium was 9, dropped to 7 within one, within one week. There is acute drop that means urgent treatment. Even if the patient is asymptomatic because acute drop, these patients most likely will develop symptoms soon if they have not developed yet. Again, if no baseline to compare to and no symptoms to really to suggest symptomatic hypocalcemia, we consider it chronic and our patient presented with lethargy and decreased oral intake, which can be attributed to UT, but also hypocalcemia can cause that, yes. So anyway, this is acute drop and I will treat urgently. What do I mean by urgent or emergent treatment? We mean inpatient treatment with IV calcium boluses, which will lead to quick but temporary rise in calcium for a few hours. That means we need to follow that by continuous or slow calcium infusion, sustained rise. This will lead to sustained rise. Now, as you know, now IV calcium, we have calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. Calcium gluconate, which I prefer, it's preferred because it's safe to be given via peripheral access, while chloride needs central line. We give one to two gram over 10 minutes. Here we give one gram over 10 minutes or half a gram over 10 minutes. The elemental amount of calcium is 90 milligram in the one gram of calcium gluconate, triple that in chloride 270. So remember, this is the calcium chloride is triple whatever in calcium gluconate. But I always go for calcium gluconate if available. Hypocalcium with severe symptoms, if I have a patient with that, I usually give one to two grams of IV calcium gluconate or 0.5 to 1 gram of calcium chloride if you have a central line. I reassess the patient's symptoms in 15-20 minutes. If symptoms persist, I give a second bolus. I check if our pharmacy makes calcium drip. You probably have not heard of this, but yes, we can make calcium drip. And usually we mix 11 gram of calcium gluconate. Remember, each gram contains 90 milligrams. So 11, that's 999. We mix it in 1000 ml of 0.9 normal saline or D5W. The concentration will be each each mil of that solution will have one milligram of elemental calcium. Or we can mix 3.5 gram of calcium chloride and then we infuse that as 50 mil per hour. That means we get 50 milligram of elemental calcium per hour. Again, this will be slow infusion and will lead to sus more sustained rise in calcium. Unlike the bullets that will lead to temporary but quick rise in calcium to relieve the symptoms. Now, if you don't have a drip, and I'm not sure if a lot of facilities probably don't have the drip, we, we, what we use scheduled boluses. We can give boluses uh, every four or every six or every eight hours, time 24 hours. Now, one important thing I want to mention here that we can slow down the infusion instead of over 10 minutes, we can say over one to two hours so we can have a more sustained rise because we don't have the drip. And IV calcium is stopped once symptoms are resolved and oral calcium is started. We'll come to that soon. Now, acute hypocalcemia and the, with no symptoms or mild symptoms, we give IV calcium bolus times one or two boluses and we start oral calcium and vitamin D because these patients are asymptomatic. Now back to our patient, the patient has acute hypocalcemia and we don't know if the symptoms are related to UTI or hypocalcemia. Anyway, I will give calcium gluconate two grams IV over 10 minutes. Then I will give calcium gluconate one gram IV over 60 minutes every six hour time, two doses. If I don't have a, a calcium drip and most likely I will use this, it's easier. And then I will start oral calcium and vitamin D level. We'll come to that. Now, all these patients, we need to start oral calcium as soon as we can. And we usually give one to two gram of elemental calcium per day, including calcium in our diet. And start vitamin D supplements if warranted. And stop IV calcium once symptoms are resolved. And oral calcium is started. And start, we start both. We'll come to that. The vitamin D and oral calcium in hypoparathyroidism. And this is another table I borrowed from up to date about the calcium, the elemental calcium in the different oral formulation that has a combination of calcium and vitamin D. You don't need to memorize it. You can just look it up. Now, in all patients with hypocalcemia, check check vitamin D level, check magnesium level. Why? Because we have to replace hypomagnesemia. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to correct hypocalcemia similar to hypokalemia. Also, check phosphorus level. As we said, hyperphosphatemia should be treated because high phosphorus lead to decreased free calcium. And check EKG and all to look at the QTC 
and see if there is a prolonged QTC or not. And if there is prolonged QTC, then this needs urgent treatment, as we explained. Now, chronic hypocalcemia plus no symptoms or mild symptoms, we only treat with oral calcium and vitamin D if warranted, if vitamin D is deficient. Now, vitamin D deficiency, as you know, we have vitamin D2, ergocalciferol, vitamin D3, cholecalciferol. These are formulations that still need to be metabolized to active form. So you need healthy kidney and healthy liver. Calcitriol, on the other hand, is a vitamin D metabolite that can bypass the need for liver and, and uh, kidney metabolism or renal metabolism. So we can use them in patients with liver disease or chronic kidney disease. And also we prefer this in acute hypoparathyroidism because it's an active form and quick action compared to slow action of vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. For dosing and how to replace it, uh, you can just look it up. Acute hypoparathyroidism, after you treat with IV calcium, as we said, you need long-term oral calcium and long-term vitamin D deficiency, preferably calcitriol. Chronic kidney disease, again, because these people has high phosphorus, we give calcium acetate. It's not really to replace the calcium rather than to bind phosphorus, because once you bind phosphorus and decrease phosphorus level, free calcium will consequently rise. And we replace with vitamin D if deficient and we give calcitriol, which is vitamin D metabolites, because if we give vitamin D2 or 3, they will need to be metabolized in the kidney and the kidney is impaired already. And the same apply for chronic liver disease. Now monitoring check calcium level again in 12 to 24 hours. Monitor the resolution of symptoms. Repeat EKG to make sure the QTC has returned back to normal. Discharge patient once symptoms resolved and calcium level above 8 mg per deciliter and you have start adequate replenishment with oral calcium and vitamin D if warranted. Thanks for watching and if you'd like again to receive a summary of this video, please subscribe to my Substack. If you found this video useful, please give it a like, share it with your colleagues and subscribe to the channel if you have not done so. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.